You should, right? 10 minutes early. So, all right, so you think you've been hacked, right? The first 30 minutes. The idea for this talk uh, came from what can I fit in 45 minutes, mm -hmm. right? And in the environment I work in, I work in a managed hosting environment where the environment and the client can change day to day, call to call, ticket to ticket, and so we never know what we're really walking into. But when we walk into something that we think may have been compromised, at whatever level, whether the application or root level, there's a couple things we're trying to do right away to establish a base or to establish some knowledge of what may have happened. And so this presentation tries to do that in about 45 minutes, right? So 30 minutes of uh, talking about it, maybe 15 for kind of post-mortem questions, things like that. So we'll see how it goes. Our agenda today. Um, we're going to start with obviously the hello parts right now, right? Chief introduction, kind of how this talk came about, where it came from, what the thought process was. And I also like to take a, a time where I'm to say hello and thank you. There's a lot of great talks going on at this time. Uh, so, for you all to choose spending time with me, I, I really appreciate it and humbled by it, so thank you. Uh, from then, we're going to go and say, identify that you've been hacked, right? We'll spend about 10 minutes in each section understanding first, are you hacked or not, right? Uh, then stop any possible activity. What can we do on a system? And I should preface that a lot of this is done from a system administrator perspective, right? Uh, this is not done from a, a home user or a desktop user or, you know, something that's more of a home use, it's more from a, a server side perspective, okay? And then uh, establishing the severity, right? Uh, am, I, am I sure that it is application level? Am I sure that it's root level, right? Um, we'll go through a few things there. Next steps, which could also be preventive measures, if you think ahead and are doing those things before you've been hacked, right? And then we'll do review, Q&A, things like that. Again, hello. Um, disclaimer. So, I traveled all the way from Texas, and in Texas, for some reason, it requires to, to do computer forensics, right? And so, the, the idea that you are going to find out information about a party on a system, if you're going to use that for a legal case, you need to have a private a PI license. Texas is one of the major, major states that does this, a few other ones do. So I figured I'd throw it out there, a disclaimer, this is for personal education, your personal use, all that, that good stuff there. Uh, there's a link if you're more uh, curious about that. Um, they're try, I think they're trying to get that taken off, but it's been there for quite a bit, right? So. All right, identify even hack, right? Something went wrong, but you're not sure what. So we hop onto a server, there could be a number of things that give us indication onto we may have been hacked or not, right? And so the first part, it might be obvious, right? Website might be defaced. You might log on and say, oh, this is not what it should be. Even worse, your customer might call you and tell you something's not right, or it's not up, or it looks different, right? And this is probably on the mild end, right? If we're, if we're being <laughs> honest about it. <laughs> um, again, with, with a managed hosting environment, thousands and thousands of customers and servers, you get to see uh, a barrage of things. And we'll see, we use the word barrage, right? Um, sometimes not so obvious, okay? Um, I wonder if they can hear me if I'm walking from the mic so much. Well, we'll the mic find out. doesn't work. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Just talk loudly. <laughs> Keep doing that. It doesn't help us, but the mic means that later on the YouTube video, people can follow your talk. So it's best to hang out by the mic. So yeah, that's what I was sure about, because I saw that they're going, so I'll walk a little less. <laughs> most of my I do walk a lot. Most of my talks do have that problem uh, in and outside. So uh, sometimes less obvious, right? So traffic spikes, uh, spam being sent from your server, your server being part of a bot pit, right? Some things are just less obvious if you're not readily monitoring them. And a lot of things that we'll cover in this presentation uh, come from the perspective of tools that are available on your system readily available either through a channel or things that are already installed by the base. Uh, if you all have something that you go to for monitoring or for stats or things like that, look at those things too, right? Uh, this is kind of from our environment where we're not sure what's installed or what we're walking into. Okay. 
maybe Google knows, right? Uh, sometimes you'll find out because you go to your website, you try to search for it, and <coughs> it says this site, bless you, maybe, maybe hacked or maybe compromised, right? Uh, so Google has a transparency report. So you can check your site and say, hey, does Google think there is unsafe content? And well, for LinuxFestNorthwest.org, it's all good. That's one way we can do it as well. All right, so step one in establishing a base, right? We might, we might think something is wrong, but we need to understand what is normal before we understand what is different, right? If a load average of 10 looks odd, you know, one day, it might be because you have a cron job running, you have something going on that spikes every day, right? But you know what's normal. So. For our different servers, web servers, DB servers, usually we'll go through the process of asking ourselves a couple questions based on what type of server it is. We identify the workload what we expect to see on it. Right? For example, if the web server is it running Apache or Nginx, should it be running Apache or Nginx? If it's my web server and I'm running Apache, if I see Nginx running, so it might be up. Right? Um, <clears throat> but we need to know that first. Right? What ports should be exposed? Should any be exposed? Question. Yeah, on your previous slide, just out of curiosity, that Google Safe Browser site, mm -hmm. is there, I guess back one more, is there an example.com where we can, where we know we will get a failure on this? I've been looking, I could not find one, unfortunately. Because if, if you're doing a demonstration, I don't want it to be offensive, but I want to show. Yeah, I, I, I looked for one. Google prepared something. Uh, there, there is, uh, if you have to test site browsing, Um, yeah, I tried to find one, but I could not find one in time. But here you go. <laughs> here we go. Thank you. All right. So, what sort of questions, right? So, what port should be exposed? Uh, if if I have Apache running, should A be listening? Maybe yes, maybe not. Right? Depends on if I'm running a CMS or a, or a Plus or CPAN. Right? Uh, and, and where does most of my traffic come from? If I know that most of my business happens within the U.S a large spike from another country might be an indication, hey, something's going on, yeah. right? Maybe, maybe not. We often have requests uh, when people think they may be hacked or, or a DDoS or something like that, like, can you just block all of China? Like, no, we're not blocking that at the firewall. Not all of China. Right? But we'll, what's that? <laughs> right? Hey, for some people it works out, right? But, Personal preference. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's just too much of a headache. Not worth it. Oh, yeah. Um, and so for database questions, right? So is it running MySQL? It shouldn't run MySQL. Right? What database users are there? If by some reason, for some reason, your database is open to the rest of the world, right? Probably shouldn't be. Maybe it should be just exposed to your web server or that environment, okay? Um, are you running a control panel? Are you running PHP MyAdmin? Is it updated, right? All these questions should we try to ask ourselves to get to start to establish a base of what our server should look like, okay? If our server is running at 1% usage for months on end, all of a sudden it's 100% for a couple hours, this thing might be up. Or it might be really popular. Oprah. Mm -hmm. Slash dot, right? Mm -hmm. All real things. Mm -hmm. General server questions, right? Just kind of can get for almost any server, right? What other services should be running? If you know you have webmin, you see a Perl process running, okay, well maybe that should be there. If you're not running webmin or any type of process like that, you see a Perl process running, it might be up. Or maybe you are using Perl. Who knows? Who's logged in, right? Should they be? If you, if you do a, a, a W to see who's logging your system and you see Apache logged in, it might be a problem, right? What do we expect to see on our system? Again, what's your average usage? Uh, have any files recently changed? And we'll go through examples of this. I'm not just going to throw them out there and, and kind of leave them there. Uh, we'll go through some examples of how to see, hey, what files may have changed, uh, what packages may have been modified. Okay. We had a, a tech one time going through some training, and for an example, we set the password to be Red Hat, right? just real simple. And so they followed along very diligently and set the password to their public server to be Red Hat. The next day we get back in class and nothing's working. Right? You can log on, but then no one else can. He ticked off and has to log on again or restart again. It looks odd. 
we go and find out that someone had logged in and replaced their SSHD binary, right? Which was giving them issues. So stuff like that, right? Should should things be modified or not? Uh, again, we see here just Google think you've been hacked. That covers from the last page. And then uh, were any cron jobs installed that you didn't expect to be installed? One of the things that we do as part of our kicks is we add Apache to cron.deny. It's only bitten us once for customers to try to add a cron job as Apache, but we do that because one of the things we saw often was that if you were compromised, one of the things you might see is that they'd add a cron job to Apache to recheck the compromise is still there and then re-add it. So you'd fix it, it'd be great, you'd come back later, and it was there again. Okay? So we add, so, so in our kicks we add a Apache to cron.deny. Right? So let's see here. So, once we've established a base, we want to ask ourselves work that they've gotten in, right? Now we know what normal looks like, what's different? Let's start to recognize what may be different, okay? So again, what processes are running, who is logged in, uh, what's the system usage? Again, a lot of these things are, are things we're going to do as demos. But again, file changed, they have already packages changed, and they wrote cron jobs. So, what processes are running? Uh, I'm going to start to begin to switch to the terminal and actually do demos I'm not going to leave you all with just a PS command on a screen and leave it there, right? Um, but what processes should be running? Let's take a look real quick here at a server. <laughs> there we go. Can everybody see that? Can you get some head nods from the back? Yep, thumbs up. Awesome. Okay. Okay, so. Right, so just PS, right? You see our, our system here. Yes, A F U X, right? To see what may be going on. Um, if we want a better look at this, we might use if it's installed. Uh, yeah, that's why I install. Well, on the spot now. Trying to remember. HTAP is one of them. Um, for PS tree. P S misc. Ooh, I got that right. PS tree. All right, uh, million PS, PS, PS. I'm just setting these up because we're going to use these later on to kind of dig in a little deeper, right? Give an idea of what's been going on. Specifically, we'll be using PS3 in this context right here for SSHD, okay? But also, yes, top, HTOP as well work really well. Uh, if top for networking as well. That doesn't show the user that's running the process. Not yet, yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll kind of dig a little further into that. So, ba -ba -ba. right, uh, who's been logged in, right? W, last, and last B. Most people know about W to see who's been logged in, right? Most people know W, who's been logged in, maybe even who, right? Um, last, who's been logged in, who was logged in, or who might still be logged in. Uh, any public server with SSH open will find a much larger list uh, than this right here. And let's see if I can't pull one up here. You know what? Let's see if that works. All right, so there's logged in there, but one more command, last B. This one seems to surprise people sometimes. Last B shows me the number of the bad attempts at logging in. Okay? Any public server should have quite a bit on there. If it's clear, that might be a cause for concern. right? Uh, because we, we do know a server on there will constantly be tried to hit by scripts, by processes, just rogue processes running. And so I've seen before that, for example, the var log W temp and B temp, right? Uh, B temp right there. Those are the ones that where last and last B are reading from. So if my B temp on this server here, let's do this server here. Yeah, if my B temp file is empty, and my server's been up for a while because some of them have cleared it, so they got covering the tracks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, could be a common practice. Um, 
if my W temp is high, and it shouldn't be because it's a web server, well, yeah, that's cause for concern. People are logging in when they shouldn't be, right? So at this point, again, I'm trying to establish a point of entry, okay? Oh, let's see here. All right, if I do this W, I see Apache logged in. Very rare do I see someone set up a server that they want Apache to log in, right? Usually it's a system user and something that they're using just to run the service, okay? System usage, SAR. Um, so I include SAR in this presentation mostly because when I talk to a lot of people like doing interviews, things like that, um, everyone has their way to do C system usage or to see uh, either top or they have Munin or they have Nagio or something installed to kind of get an idea of their system. Again, walking into a managed hosting environment where we're not sure what we're seeing on the system using tools that are kind of common or built in, right? So the SAR package comes from, or the SAR command comes from a sys, uh, sysstat package. And it gives us a chance to see, uh, unlike top, where top shows what's going on right now, SAR will show us what's been happening in the past, okay? So if my server is running very hot right now, so I've got 100% CPU usage, I can say, hey, how long has it been going on, right? So I can do a SAR by itself and get an idea of CPU usage, okay? But I'm looking here to say, okay, well, it's been in user space or idle pretty consistent, right? So if this changed, then I'd be saying, okay, what's been going on, okay? Uh, same thing for other stats on there, SAR dash Q for load average, right? This, I'm looking at the numbers here, my run size, I'm looking at my process list size. Do those change frequently, do you often? If they're pretty consistent and I see a big spike, what happened there, right? This can also help me establish a time frame from when I may have been compromised, okay? Okay, if I'm going the same all the way through and I see a spike, well, maybe I can look at that, that time frame in my logs, in my security logs, so bar log secure or bar log off, right, depending on your system, okay? Let's see here. Have any files changed, right? So on a new server, if I ran this on, if I ran this on my local server I just spun up with an uptime of uh, 30 minutes, right? A whole lot of things are gonna change, right? It's a brand new box. A lot of things are less than a day old. But I shouldn't see that or as much on a server I've been running for a while, right? Two or eight days. I should probably reboot, but <laughs> do it later. <laughs> At this point, it'll probably be painful to reboot, so we're not going to. But again, a little, a little less. Probably obviously, proc is going to be there all the time. My presentation I just uploaded, things like that, right? So proc and sys, we can begin to filter those out and then begin to see, okay, outside of that, so maybe egrep-v uh, proc sys. All right, we're gonna see what's been changed in the last day or so. And I, see, I expect that, right? I expect to see my slide up there in the last day or so, okay? Um, but if I see passwords up there, I ain't not a user, right? I mean, I start beginning to just check for specific files. They don't just give me a, a, a big list. I check for specific files. Uh, empty shadow, yeah, maybe it should have changed in the last day or so. I'm not expecting it to, right? And we can change that, the M time, to be one or two, depending on how long the server has been up. If I come over here and say one, not a whole lot, right? The server's been up for 30 minutes. Nothing's older than a day. Essentially, it's been changed in the last day. Okay. <laughs> Have any packages been modified? This is a, this is a fun one because uh, sometimes they'll replace the binary, right? So for Apache, or for SSHD, as I mentioned earlier, they'll replace the binary and won't match up with what's in our database. So we can check these things as well. So I have the command up here, but real quick I want to go one slide over and just talk about what the grouping here means. So when we see this, this line right here, Okay, so if I see capital S there, it means the size has been changed, um, the mode has been different, right, the MD5, some, something's been changed on there. Um, <coughs> and I'll tell you for 
Etsy HBD conf dot D. And then I expect that, right? I expect my Apache configuration might have changed. I changed it from the default, right? I didn't just install Apache and leave it alone. But if, for some example, SSHD has an issue for the size is different than expected, well, maybe that's a problem, right? Or the permissions are different on the file than expected, okay? Or even the ND5 something. So let's take a look at that a little bit. On the server here. Do you know of an equivalent tool for uh, Ubuntu or Debian? Debsums, I think, does the same. So what is that with that? Debsums. Debsums? It yeah. does a, a hash check against package files. Yeah. You have to forgive me. My, uh, my primary work, iOS is sent in Red Hat, so a lot of examples come quickly from that. Uh, so I'll rely on some of y'all for the Debian portion of it. I've been wanting to do that for a while, so I looked at Debsums. All right, so right here I don't have Apache installed. Let's go ahead and install it, right? So yum dash y install. We'll give it a second to come up. Easy, awesome. So RPM dash v. Nothing's changed. That makes sense. We just installed it, and what it's saying is nothing's changed from the database entries. What it knows to be when installed. Okay. As a simple example. Simple as that, right? And then, ah, okay, so our config files change. But I expect that, right? If I wanted to get crazy about it, let's just see what happens, right? Um, all things have been changed from the package. Now, with all of these steps and these kind of getting those first 30 minutes or so, if you can spin up a new server and now today is with speed to a cloud server or additional resources, it should be easy enough to spin up a server that should be good, it shouldn't be hacked, right? And compare. Right? Again, establishing that base of what is normal for us. Okay? Because a lot of these I bet you are changed by Red Hat themselves or sent themselves. To from what the core might be, or it should update later on. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Ba -ba -boom. Let me try page here. All right, checking your logs. Um, I mentioned in here last and last B, the authentication logs for your server, whatever that might be, right? Log Secure will tell you when someone's logged in, when a password's been changed, update, a user's been created. So the logs aren't there just to, to be there, right? They're there for us to review when things like this happen, right? Maybe you're setting up, uh, maybe as a, as a next step or as a preventive measure, you're setting up centralized logging so that you can be sure they're not modified and been changed, right? Uh, and web server, if, you, if your website is mostly requests, right, for in mostly um, get requests, very large or odd post requests might be an issue, right? Many of the exploits for, for common CMS systems, WordPress, uh, Drupal, things like that, are trying to inject these to a database or trying to inject things to your server that are coming through as requests, right? So many of the things to look for there. You can even narrow your search down to what might be an issue, right? Again, trying to establish that point of entry. <coughs> so hopefully by this point, we begin to establish something, right? Whether it be an application that we think may be compromised because we see files written by that user somewhere it shouldn't be. One time, we had compromise for a Java application, it was a Java application that was running in a home Java something. But the application, we got the we kind of, the developer and I kind of tied it to it was the application had been updated, and then we saw. It was, it was owned by the root user, right? But then we begin to see that some processes, some files were owned by Java, some files were owned by root, right? So at that point there, we kind of have to say, you were probably root compromised. If your application running as a root user can write files to your disk, you're probably compromised at that root level, okay? So like at this point, hopefully we've established a point of entry and kind of begin to focus our efforts into how to stop what's been going on. So, Killing off SSH connections 
without killing off your own. <laughs> it's important to think about that. Uh, tables, who's locked themselves out at least once by tables? Oh, yeah. Are we having great? They, they say it's, uh, you, don't ask, you don't ask a room to raise hands for something because usually it can fail and no one responds. Pretty sure that one's pretty safe. Uh, I've done it a million times. I'm sure some of you all have done it at least more than once, right? Uh, and also with killing connections off, you'll read online, oh, just kill dash nine bash. Well, that might be yours. We don't want to do that. <laughs> so one thing I try to stress when training or mentoring uh, system administrators at, at work is, you know, you're going to find answers that might work and solve your problem, but with a hammer, right? Instead of a fine precision way of doing it. So we're going to try to do this without killing off our own connection, OK? So doing some research kind of put this together uh, in, in a nicer way. So we want to get the PID of the root SSHD process, right? So we're going to use that and feed it into PS tree to give us which process of SSH is ours, and then by that nature, which one's not ours as well, OK? So, uh, I, have, I have the steps up here just for reference. We're going to go through the command line and kind of go through it a little more in depth. Uh, again, I'm actually going to leave you all with just commands on the screen here. Okay. How am I on time? Yeah, okay. All right, so let's grab this here. Okay. All right, that gives me a process ID. But let's break it down a little bit. Pit up SSHD. That gives me all in line. This middle part here is just translating spaces to new lines so that I can sort it and feed it into a different command if I want to, right? That at least allows me to sort it out and then pull out the, the earliest number. The idea being here is that earliest number is probably the original SSHD process. Let's check that out. If I do a PS tree dash P, we have that as well, right? Let me log into this machine again so we begin to see what it looks like with multiple people on the server. P grep would also work, so let's get the pin. Mm -hmm. would also work, yeah. But P grep would give you, you grep the process name, yeah. right? Not just the, the, the pin, yeah, sorry. Yeah, P grep would also work. Um, let's see here. I tend to P grep a lot, so. Um, I learned PID of first, and so that's why I go. I gravitate to that one. Okay. Uh, people, whatever people learn first, seem to gravitate towards that, right? Yeah. yeah. Like for you'll see later on, SS or Netstat. My alphabet soup is what I learned first behind it. So T L A N T or T L U P N behind that, right? Um, someone asked me, "What does that mean?" Like, give me what I need. Gives me this information. I'm not sure which one means without the man page, right? right. That's what you learn first, I guess. Uh, let's see here. P W D Santa OS. All right, so all I did here was I'm setting up so that I'm logging to my machine more than one time. Uh, let's get this a little bigger here, just in case we can switch these screens. This one is the other server that I can get rid of for now. All right, here we go. So if we see now here, we have more logins coming, okay? So this is representing the SHD process the fourth processes and then all the processes that are for, uh, created from that original one, right? So how do I know which one is mine? Okay, there's a couple of ways we can do this. But let's do this. Come back to our screen here. Okay, here. Okay, so that, this command here is what we did earlier, right? So that's a term that, that very first root as a process. The H and the P, so the P is showing show me the tree from just this process. The H highlights for my session. Okay, so knowing that, I can begin to kill off these right here, All right? And I want to kill off the bash process, not the SSHD process. Okay, kill the bash process will log them out. Sometimes I've seen killing the SHD process itself doesn't necessarily disconnect them. It's still kind of running. The connection is still there. Okay. So let's see here. Maybe at this point here. Um, so now I know that this is mine. 
I'll do the same for the other machines or the logins. You can see the difference here. If I go ahead and sudo su and do the same thing here, right? I'm highlighting which one's mine. Notice that that string's gotten a little longer as I've done more things, right? Execute more processes. But then coming back to our original one again, highlighting what's current to my session. And that's going to be kill people that are not me. Because in the situation we're in right now, where we're not sure if we're hacked or not, kill off mine, I may not be able to get back in, right? So, kill dash nine. And usually I'll kill, I'll kill off the first bash process here. So I'll kill off that one. Let me see the little update here. Thing kicked off, right? For the next one, I'm going to kill the SSHD process. We can see that behavior. Okay, so if I run this again, and we'll run, I'll kill off this first one here. We'll try this first. Now in practice, question? Yes. I'm wondering why you went straight for the dash nine. Did you have some reason to think you needed it? Or are you just like in the list? It's first 30 minutes, really what it comes down to, right? It's more of a, I need to, I want to make sure I'm getting these off. Uh, doing a kill, you sometimes has been, it just doesn't respond to it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I've had that happen a couple times, not often, but this is more of that kind of, uh, let's get them out. Let's make sure they're out. Yeah, minus um, nine is signal. Yeah, yeah there, there's no syscall. If you do the sig hop or just a kill, mm -hmm. they, if, the guy, if the hacker had some brain cells in himself, he would have compromised the SSH and he would have the sig trap yeah. on that one. And that, through that sig trap, he would then, he would then shut off. Is, is a, a time process to say a cron job or whatever in the background mm -hmm. onto your machine yep. and use that so that in five minutes you see everything's gone, you're happy, you walk away, you come back the next day and all these processes come back. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, happened to you, yeah. If the hacker, you know, was, if the hacker was, that, was that smart, you actually would have replaced the various commands <laughs> with the EO cell was smart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying is, is that he, the person was that smart, yeah. yeah. Which brings to the question always like, well, we had customers who are like, well, are you sure I'm hacked? Well, if they really are, and it's that bad, we can't be sure, we won't know, right? Because they've covered up that much of it, right? Call the blue cord that's in the back of your computer. <laughs> <laughs> Safest way possible, right? All right, so let's kill this, I'll kill this one off here, and we'll see how it responds on, I believe it's gonna be this one right here believe so let's kill that off and notice it's still there right if I do a PS tree I'm not sure how this will actually run as not root but should yeah three six six one Not showing up. Well, that's right. The uh, that process is gone. Yeah, that makes sense. That showed up there. So the SHC process, all that's gone, but that person is still technically logged in, right? That's why I'm killing that bash process instead of the SH catching back up. Uh, so, all right. Let's see here. So how does that work if the person ran on a no pop? I haven't looked at it from that perspective, so you know, to be honest, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Go ahead. Oh, no, say, I'm not sure. I haven't looked at it from that perspective, say from that particular angle on it. Uh, usually for me, a dash nine is working. If it's not, we're looking at, okay, assuming a, a root compromise and, and reinstalling for a fresh OS, right? Uh, we're not digging too, too much into it past that. Yeah. If I Usually for that, we're using screen, so. Yeah. <laughs> so but I'm like that, in that frame, I'm using it too much, so. Um, 
and the new person always forgets to use screen and is stuck watching a database dump for the next six hours. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> There's always that chuckle, it's like, yeah, you've done that. <laughs> All right, so, um, also thank you for the questions and the feedback, I appreciate it, let's keep it, keep it going. Um, so, the locking out SHU, right? So, once we've kicked everybody off, right, the next step is to start locking people out until we figure out a little bit more what's been going on or how to remedy it. And so, if you look online how to lock a user out, you might see the first one right there. Here's a mod dash L, lock a user out. What that does, it modifies the hash in the Etsy shadow file, therefore invalidating the password. But if that person has a key and they install the key, which is a trivial thing to do and take no time at all, that won't lock them out, right? You're, you're, you're bypassing up the, uh, password authentication and see if a key is still is active. So we had the next step here to do a CHH, change age, and expire the user. Right? So that they, know, they would be forced to change the password um, if their account wasn't locked. So that's a way to keep them out from, from both sides. And we'll just run through that real quick as a demo to kind of see what it looks like. Okay. Let's see here. We'll log in here. Use red, we'll say Alex. Okay. And I'll do a chh l Alex. I'm just getting a base of what a new account looks like. Okay. Now let's do a chh dash e and then Alex. Tell you that wrong. That worked last time. <laughs> the date. Yeah. I forgot how to write a date, so let's do this. You can do now. Can I, I wasn't can sure I about this. <laughs> Thank you all. I wasn't sure about that. I know it works that way, but it works out. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Uh, here, so count expires never. Count expires today, right? So with that in place, uh, let's go ahead and set a password real quick. Kind of show you what that first that first one does. So if I get a set a password for Alex and say, mm, okay, that's as he shadow. Are you grip? Uh, this line right here, when we do a lock, right? So this is my, my essentially my salted password hash, right? So what type of password? What type of password? The salt, then the hash itself. When I go ahead and do a uh, find it here, user mod dot dash l, Alex. Notice that we're invalidating that line. With that point there, right? And that's all we're doing, we're locking the user out. If we unlock it, it removes that, right? So we're essentially we're, just we're not changing the password, right, per se, but the hash itself has changed and who knows that we're matched. And you wouldn't just remove the user, you would expire them and lock them. Yeah. Um, so if that's a user that it's a valid user, but maybe they're compromised, we don't want to delete their home directory or kind of move things out. Uh, or if they were if we knew that they were not authorized. Not supposed to be there, then yeah, we're gonna go ahead and delete them. Um, if it's a user we expect to see there, maybe we just lock it out and kind of do some remedy on that. Yeah. I got to about 415. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oof, okay. Well, let's keep going. Outbound connections. Um, there we go. So, I mentioned in the previous slide, or earlier slide, right, sometimes it's not so obvious that you may have been compromised. One time we had a customer who, everything ran fine for them, and all of a sudden, everything's running slow, on their firewall is seeing a flood, of connect, a flood of outgoing traffic, and most people couldn't pick it out, pick, it, pick up on it. Right, they would go to their server, and they would do something like, uh, let's see here, SS or netstat dash plant. I'll do plant. That's what I do, right? 
and they'll see, hey, there's not, not, not a lot of things going on. They're doing a lot of this command to kind of see what may be going on, connection-wise, what's listening, and they didn't see anything. But yet, the firewall was important, they're being flooded, right? They couldn't take any more traffic on what they're, what they're doing. Uh, what most, most people don't do is add in you, right, for UDP traffic. Often we saw customers that were compromised sending a flood of UDP traffic out. And so that was affecting another customer, also affecting their server because they couldn't issue any commands, everything was kind of full there. Right? And so one thing we can do, at least here on the screen here, is kind of look at our outbound connections. Um, I'll bring it up here real quick. That's how I was watching the Mirai botnet spread as I ran Netstead on my router and had all these telnet connections outbound. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the Mirai. Yeah. <laughs> kill, kill, kill. <laughs> And a lot of people forget about UDP out or, or anything going out, right? Um, it's not just what we think about readily, right? Uh, so we try to train to say, look what may be going out, because how they're using that server once it's compromised could be a, a, a wide array of things, right? So by, by omitting the A or L, right, I'm only seeing what's going out. So TCP, UDP, the process name, and then I'm not doing resolve DNS res uh, resolution. Right with the dash n, I did look. I did look those up ahead of time, so I knew what they were, and not just put them out there. <laughs> so, but that was like yesterday. Um, and so we see what catch is going out here. Okay, um, let's take a look here at another server and say when it is online and say put in. Right. A few more things, uh, but I expect a lot of these. This is my server I'm running the presentation on, so I expect a lot of that. <laughs> It would be ironic to be like, oh no, I don't expect that at all. Wait, I see a telnet connection in there. <laughs> I'm using that. You know. no. um, and so looking at about connections, if we see something that may be, hey, it shouldn't be there, go ahead and drop them, right? We could try and log them if we want to, but that might overwhelm our system even more, right? So we could drop them. And this is something we use quite often to drop those, that flood of UDP traffic and press them back to life, right? Um, it wasn't, the process was still going on. It gave a chance to kind of figure out where that process was coming from without trying to kill everything off, right? So this gave a chance to not reboot, get our system back, and do a little more discovery on what might be happening, okay? It didn't work all the time, but it worked most of the time, right? Um, so we do have tables dash A output. So if you guys are familiar with IP tables, usually we're doing dash A input, right, to have a rule to allow something in. Here we're doing egress rules to say a rule that for something can go out. We had one customer that insisted that everything was locked down in and out, but continually called, why wasn't this working? Why wasn't this working? Why wasn't this working? Every time, well, did you open it up on the way out? Well, no. He was with the company for a little bit, and then he we gone. So, I think he also had cron job to restart Apache every every night at midnight because he couldn't figure out the memory leak in his application. <laughs> so, and they were a uh, a merchant, an online merchant. So, if they buy anything at midnight, we buy anything at midnight. So, fun stuff. All right. So, um, let me see what we got here. Make sure. I'm Coming up here, uh, yeah, cron jobs. So let's kind of, I'm going to go through a little faster than I would normally. Make sure I'm hitting time on this. Uh, so check it for cron jobs, right? Uh, I mentioned earlier that something we saw often was that a, a compromised server would inject a cron job for Apache and make sure they constantly reapply that, that information. So check all the normal places, right? If you do an ls empty cron output, thing, things there should look normal, but also check. Uh, bar spool cron, that's where all the user cron jobs are placed, okay? And then also, to kind of see what's going on, var log cron, right? That should look familiar to you, it should be a lot of sysstat, should be a lot of the normal things we see here, uh, but if you see something that's not that, it might be having an issue, right? So. All right, so, establishing the severity. At this point, kind of to bring us to the same page here, we have established our base, what's normal for us. We have hopefully established an entry point that in this application or this user or 
something to that effect. And now we want to say, okay, we also we stopped what could be happening, right? Killing off SSH connections, killing off users, uh, patching applications, things like that. Uh, but now we want to start with severity, right? Now we can get a little bit of breathing room. We dropped that UDP connection that's that's preventing our system from being overwhelmed. So it's established a little bit of severity. And most things will fall into two major buckets, as you see here, application level and root level, okay? Uh, fair warning, right? If you think you're compromised at all, your safest bet is always install a fresh OS, right? And backups that you hopefully know are before the compromise, right? <laughs> because we've had that happen too, right? Where the customer will continue to re, re, uh, restore the same problem over and over and over. Uh, and when you're frantic and you're not sure what's going on, this may be the first time happening to you, you might make a mistake a couple times, and you might feel it's only you can do, right? But we, we can have other options. But yeah, I, I say all, the, what I say next is all with uh, the safest thing that is to reinstall. Question? Uh, but if you just reinstall or to back up, what you would be reinstalling saying from the build that you had before? So, so hopefully, hopefully not, right? If we, if we establish a time frame from where our vulnerability happened, and we store we store before that, right? Then we change to patch everything before bringing it online, right? That's why I say hopefully we establish a point of entry, we restore from OS, we get our backup that's good before bringing it online, before opening up 488, 443, we patch it. Hopefully, right? And also change your patch server. Yeah, yeah. Go that Pardon? Change your patch server. Okay. That you can fit that was configured in. Mm. That's like what in the and yeah. back in the planning phase, you should record in your your patching for patching server for your Linux <coughs> boxes, mm. so that if you do get compromised, you pick another patching server in their tree, so mm. you can get patched from it just in case it was compromised in the patching one. That's the one upstream in the patching. Yeah. And hopefully you're in a non you're taking it from a non-compromised branch. Yeah, that, that, that's that'd be a very very sad thing if that was what happens. <laughs> so yeah, but yeah, that's also things you change change your your. Uh, like for your Ubuntu PPA to change your your patch rate post for sure. Um, so uh, okay, cool. All right. Uh, so with the application level compromise, were you able to tie it to a user? If you were, you're pretty sure maybe you invalidate the user SSH keys. Maybe you uh, lock the user route, change your password, all those things, um, or maybe restore from just that user's directory. Right? Are you sure you know what application was the culprit? Right, and what application running as root, right? Because if, if, if the last one here is true, it's running as root, you have to assume at some point that you're in, at the very least root level compromise uh, for that one server. Who knows about the other ones, right? One thing to keep in mind is that if one server was compromised and you can log in from one server to another in your network, you're not sure how far that's gone, right? And that can be a problem. That is a problem. Not you can be, it is a problem. It's a very scary problem. <laughs> it is. Depending on the size of your environment, one, two, or a hundred, right? Real quick, and the bigger your environment is, the more likely you are to make it easy for you to log in from server to server to test things out. This is where you need to uh, segregate your network. So you know your printer, your compromised printer can't screw over your finances. Oh yeah, or your light bulb your even. Light bulb, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be anything these days, right? Yeah. Uh, root level compromise, right? Uh, again, if it's if it's running as root, uh, you're hosed. To say it, your host, right? Uh, can you tie it to a user with pseudo access, right? If it's, uh, you know, Joe login and they have access to pseudo, well, they probably without a password, right? Because that's what we did. It's easier, right? Well, then they have access to your system as well, right? And you find, the, or you find the user was logged in because your password was weak, or you didn't uh, set no root login in SSHD, right? To prevent that. So, that question back there, or? RK Hunter, um, for Rookie Hunter. Uh, usually we, we do this uh, as a precaution. We don't use it as the end all be all to say you are or not with no compromise. Uh, this gives us a better idea to say, okay, you may be okay, nothing shows up here, but we're not sure. Right? It's always with the, you yeah, have to be cautious about this, right? But to give you an idea of what comes in that, that output here, um, see here, yum, dash one. I have <laughs> you gotta read those logs, right? Um, and if I, I was, well, not obviously, but if this box was like I thought it compromised, I probably wouldn't be doing it from a yum install 
from those repos, right? Uh, if I think it's compromised. Maybe the repos themselves are again been changed or compromised. Uh, if you think it's compromised, try and install from a different repo or try and install from source if you feel you can or just move it over, right? One or two. Because um, you never know. Or create yourself a statically linked bi binary tool box yeah. that you can mount on it and that it has no and has no support. It does not have as compiled in the uh, libraries. You said like you've done this a couple times. <laughs> And then therefore, it, it, even if they compromise, the, if they got into a rootkit at the syscall level, you bypass that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. a lot of people resort to BusyBox and then make sure BusyBox is a compromise, at least you can rescue your system. Yeah. Why don't you all get up here and talk? It's great. <laughs> we'll do a panel next. <laughs> Love it. All right, so, Arkie Hunter. Again, running a little bit low on time here, but kind of run through just to get a demo of what it looks like, right? Um, again, some of the warnings up here might be okay, depending on what OS you're running. A brand new OS, OS might have those on there. Uh, so again, being able to establish that base of what it looks like, right? What it should look like. Okay. And it goes through with a bunch of not found, not found, not found. I, if one of those says found, I'd be very, very surprised right now. <laughs> and very, very sad. <laughs> Scanning the server and your website right now? No, local local server. Okay. Yeah. Who knows? Alright, let's go back to our slides here. Alright, so next steps, right? So as we're coming to a close here, um, now we're past our first 30 minutes. We've tried to establish the point of entry, establish a base, what's normal. And try to really do some sort of remedy what we can. Okay, so next steps could be also seen as preventive measures, right? Uh, if you have a service that's running as root, take time to take inventory and try to have them not run as root. Get your permissions correct. Get your set uh, in, in a place where you have, don't have to run as root. Patch the effect applications, right? Update your WordPress, your Drupal, your uh, Plesk or cPanel. Patch your system. Pretty pretty normal things. Um, but also run on a supported operating system. Uh, so Ubuntu 18.04 just came out, right? Ubuntu 18.04 is their LTS release, right? So long-term support, much more, a much longer term of support for patches, for security, things like that, than maybe uh, 17.10. I'm trying to do this in my head, um, right? 17.10 might have support for nine months, maybe around that, maybe a year. And what we saw, and the reason I highlight this a little bit is because what we saw with uh, some of the most recent like uh, vulnerabilities like Heartbleed and stuff like that was that customers are coming in and saying, Why, how come I'm not patched? And at the time, I think it was, they were running 1510, right? They were, they were running a LTS release. So their 1204 box was still being patched. Their 1404 box was still being patched, but their 1510 wasn't. And they couldn't understand it was new, it was newer, why wasn't it getting patched, right? So understanding your vendor and what they'll support and how long they're supporting the project or product is also helpful, okay? And then all of this is presented from a systems administrator perspective, right? I, I'm not by any means a professional. Um, there are people who are, you know a lot more and are, that's their, their goal and their profession, right? So at the very, very least, right, if you are concerned still, Reach out professional. Reach out to people who do this uh, day in, day out. They might give you a different perspective or get a chance to look at something else. If not, just even a, a better peace of mind. Right. Question. So we're using Terraform to run immutable infrastructure so we can quickly recover. Mm -hmm. Are there any other best practices there? <sighs> no, immutable infrastructure sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, not that I can get off the top of my head. Yeah. Um, Teach, share, right? Teach that. Teach those practices. To everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Question. Say for instance, you have a very like a very high activity server. Let's say it's a, a um, file server as well as a web server, and you want to see if the file server has been uh, breached. And you showed the example of like the find slash and find zero. What if you want to get more granular with time? Let's like, see things that have been like, hidden. 
I believe there's an option in Find, but I'm not sure. Um, nice there. Give him time. Uh, nice. I saw that, but it was like day. So. Off the top of my head, again, I'm not sure, but we can take a look at that hang out and we'll just figure it out. Yeah. You can do fractional information. Yeah, fractional information. All right, um, so, thank you all. Um, so, in review, um, kind of we go through the end of this. Got the mic again. Uh, identify if you've been hacked by knowing what your base is, recognizing what the difference is, establishing that point of entry and time frame of compromise. Right, this is going to help you get that first look at what might be going on. All right, next step: stopping activity or locking out users, stopping any suspicious things going on. Uh, outgoing traffic could be one of those big things there, depending on what the nature of that compromise is. Lastly, try to establish the severity of how to and determine how to proceed. Right, again. It's your call if you want to deem it to be a application level, say you fixed it and continue on, right? Sometimes that's what the, the business needs, if you will. All right, Q&A, which has been going on the entire time, which I thank you all very much for. Okay. Or we talk about whiskey for the next one minute. One minute. <laughs> uh, if you guys want to reach out later on, uh, again, my name is Alex Suarez. I work for Rackspace. There's information right there if you'd like more information. Thank you all.